Recently, China's General Administration of Customs released its import and export data for March. Surprisingly, exports increased by 14.8 percent year on year, almost exceeding everyone's expectations. However, Chinese ports did not appear to be busy, with empty containers still piling up, which is not consistent with the surge in exports. Additionally, there has been a flood of news online about foreign trade companies relocating out of China or going bankrupt, as well as a wave of massive unemployment. So, what is the real reason behind this export boom? In this video, we will try to find out. On April 13th, data released by the General Administration of Customs showed that China's total import and export value in March was 542.99 billion U.S. dollars. A year-on-year -year increase of 7.4 percent. Exports reached 315.59 billion U.S. dollars, up by 14.8 percent year-on-year, compared to an expected decline of 5 percent. Imports were 227.4 billion U.S. dollars, down by 1.4 percent year-on-year, compared to an expected decline of 5.2 percent. The trade surplus was 88.19 billion U.S. dollars, up by 98.8 percent year on year. This is indeed a very impressive data set. In January and February of this year, exports declined by 6.8 percent year on year. So why did exports surge in March? Firstly, according to China's seasonal export patterns, January and February are usually the off season, but the export values will rebound in March. The second reason is the impact of last year's epidemic prevention and control measures. The recovery of production capacity after reopening in December last year takes time, and it coincided with China's traditional holiday, the Spring Festival, in January. Therefore, the backlog of orders in the early stages concentrated on the surge in March. These are probably the two main reasons. However, this growth is not sustainable. As the most direct evidence is that the in-hand orders of foreign trade manufacturers have been decreasing, and export orders have been cancelled. We have previously reported many times that many foreign trade factories have been forced to take leave or go bankrupt due to the decrease in orders. Therefore, the surge in exports in March may only be the release of squeezed production capacity in the early stages, and may not necessarily indicate a recovery in exports. Whether it will shrink afterwards will be revealed after the release of April's foreign trade data. Let's take a look at the sub-item data. In terms of export goods, compared with the previous few months, labor-intensive products, electromechanical products, and agricultural products have all seen double-digit growth. Among them, the highest growth was seen in automobiles, which increased by 123.8 percent year on year. Auto parts also achieved a growth rate of 25.3 percent. Steel increased by 51.8 percent. Exports in clothing, textile yarn, and plastic products all showed a brilliant performance. However, the export of high-tech products decreased by 10.39 percent year on year. In terms of regions, China's exports to Russia in March increased by 136.4 percent year on year, far exceeding other economies. Which contributed to China's export growth by 1.9 percent. Against the backdrop of Russia's ongoing international sanctions, China's economic and trade relations with Russia have clearly strengthened. ASEAN countries, or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, were the largest export destination for China in March, with a year-on-year -year increase of 35 percent, making it an important contributor to China's exports in March. Next was Hong Kong, with mainland China's exports to Hong Kong increasing by 20 percent year on year in March. Exports to emerging markets such as Latin America also achieved high growth, with a year on year increase of 18.8 percent. On the contrary, China's exports to the United States fell by 8 percent, while exports to the EU returned to positive growth for the first time since October 2022, with a reading of 3 percent. Since replacing the EU as China's largest trading partner last year, ASEAN has maintained a relatively high level of trade with China. One important reason for this is that ASEAN is the main destination for China's industrial chain transfer. Not only have many foreign-funded factories relocated from China to ASEAN countries, but some domestic Chinese enterprises have also invested in setting up factories in these countries, 
along with the transfer of the industrial chain. These manufacturing companies that have relocated overseas are accustomed to having raw material procurement and the vast majority of processes in China, leaving only the last one or two processes to be completed overseas. For example, furniture production companies will do the final painting and assembly overseas. This not only saves on some labor costs, but more importantly, avoids the high tariffs on exporting products to the U.S. due to the China-U.S. trade war. This made ASEAN the export destination for China's intermediate products, general equipment, and other commodities. The export data also shows that in the first quarter, China's exports of intermediate products to ASEAN reached 77.29 billion U.S. dollars, a year-on-year -year increase of 17.9%. On the other hand, China's investment and infrastructure project cooperation with ASEAN has deepened, driving an increase in exports in related fields. The General Administration of Customs pointed out that in the first quarter, China's exports to ASEAN through foreign contracted projects increased by 92.9% year-on-year. From the above data, we can draw a conclusion that China exports a large amount of raw materials and semi-finished products to ASEAN countries and Southeast Asian countries can sell them to the large markets in Europe and America after completing the assembly. In addition, China has a large amount of transnational transit trade, which does not need to enter China and can be directly shipped to ASEAN countries. For example, China can directly purchase raw materials from some countries and then sell them to ASEAN countries. It can also complete primary processing or original equipment manufacturing in a transit country, before shipping semi-finished products to ASEAN countries. In addition to shipping by sea, goods from China to ASEAN can also be transported by land. For example, after the opening of the China-Vietnam Friendship Pass, a dedicated international cargo transportation channel at the Friendship Border Crossing, more than 1,300 freight trucks travel via this special channel every day. Taking e-cigarettes as an example, in the past two years, a rapidly growing e-cigarette trade route originating from China has emerged. Container ships loaded with lithium batteries, oil-absorbing cotton, and heating wires depart from Shenzhen and travel south, stopping at the port of Batam Island in Indonesia after passing through the Strait of Malacca, and then transported by trucks to an industrial park 15 kilometers away from the port. Dozens of workers sit in a rolling assembly line injecting e-liquid into pre-assembled oil-absorbing cotton and sealing it. Soon, these parts are assembled into finished products, transported back to the port, and then shipped through the Strait of Malacca to the locations of 82 million e-cigarette users around the world. Who is controlling this trade route? The answer is the Chinese. As early as 2021, a group of Chinese businessmen began to appear in Indonesia, in the past, they were active in Shenzhen, Dongguan, and their surrounding areas, and controlled nearly 90% of the global e-cigarette production capacity. Currently, savvy Chinese businessmen are pouring into Southeast Asia, trying to replicate their past successes in new markets. This gold rush is still surging, and the transformation of the e-cigarette industry is also part of this wave. Their appearance in Indonesia was not all intentional. Most of the e-cigarette OEM factories in Shenzhen and Dongguan are OEMs for international brands, especially the leading factories. Over the years, due to fierce competition and the recent instability of the Chinese supply chain, brand owners have required these leading OEM factories to set up factories in other countries with lower tax and labor costs. The reason why Indonesia was chosen is not only because Indonesia is the largest economy in Southeast Asia with a population of more than 270 million, ranking fourth in the world, but also because it has the largest overseas Chinese population. At the same time, Indonesia has more than 70 million smokers and is the only country in Southeast Asia that allows tobacco advertising on television and other media. Before the arrival of e-cigarette companies, Indonesia had attracted brands such as Nike and Uniqlo, and established factories with its cheap labor force. China's big four shoe brands, Baosheng, Fengtai, Yuqi, and Zhixiong, have set up factories in Indonesia, making Indonesia the second largest producer of Nike sports shoes. In 2021, Indonesia produced 26% of Nike sports shoes, second only to Vietnam. In addition to cheap labor, 
Another advantage of Indonesia is tariffs. The United States is the world's largest consumer of e-cigarettes, consuming 58% of China's annual exports of e-cigarettes. In April 2018, the United States released a list of goods subject to additional tariffs on China. The first batch of goods, including $34 billion worth of goods, was subjected to a 25% tariff starting in July of that year, including e-cigarettes. This meant that the tariff on disposable e-cigarettes exported from China to the United States increased from the original 6.5% to 31.5%. However, since Indonesia resumed its most favored nation status in 2020, the e-cigarette kits exported from Indonesia to the U.S. are subject to a 2.6% import tariff, which is 28.9% lower than that of China. This is a significant incentive for manufacturers. According to U.S. law, if a company wants to enjoy tariff preferences, it must obtain a certificate of origin issued by the exporting country. The prerequisite for obtaining a certificate of origin is that 35% of the value of the finished product, including purchasing raw materials and hiring local workers for production, must remain in the country. In other words, if a company wants to obtain a certificate of origin, it must build factories in Indonesia or other countries, hire local labor for production, and purchase local raw materials. For e-cigarette companies that build factories in Indonesia, Obtaining a certificate of origin is not difficult. They simply need to adjust the proportion of semi-finished products purchased from China, or more directly, bribe Indonesian customs officials. In fact, to avoid heavy tariffs, Chinese businessmen will first ship their products to third-party countries, change the containers in bonded areas to obtain certificates, and then ship them to the U.S., thereby avoiding the 25% tariff. Compared with applying for a certificate of origin, A more popular and simpler method in the past was to establish shell companies in Indonesia, Malaysia, and other countries, change the packaging of goods locally, and then ship them to the United States. Actually, e-cigarettes are just one of many export commodities operated by Chinese businessmen in this way. This explains why ASEAN replaced the European Union as China's largest trading partner last year. However, ASEAN will not be the final consumer market. Is just a transit stop. In addition, statistics show that in the first quarter of 2023, the trade volume between China and Russia was 53.846 billion U.S. dollars, a year-on-year -year increase of 38.7 percent. Among them, China's exports to Russia were 24.07 billion U.S. dollars, an increase of 47.1 percent, while China's imports from Russia were 27.77 billion U.S. dollars. An increase of 32.6 percent. Therefore, Russia was also a significant contributor to China's foreign trade. China and Russia have two sea transportation routes for their trade, with one having lower shipping fees. This route involves unloading goods at European ports after transporting them from Chinese coastal ports, then moving them to feeder ships for transportation to Saint Petersburg, Russia. However, due to the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war. This route has been suspended by Europe. The second route involves transporting goods directly from Chinese coastal ports to Russian Far East ports, followed by railway transportation to reach Moscow. Nevertheless, this route has longer railway transportation distance within Russia and greater temperature differences during transit. As the partnership between China and Russia continues to strengthen, railways are increasingly important in cargo transportation. The Russian railway company is launching an international multimodal transport route from China through Kazakhstan to Russia, connecting Shenzhen and Saint Petersburg using both railway and highway transportation. The expected delivery time for containers is 18 days. Furthermore, the China-Russia Tongjiang Railway Bridge opened on April 27, 2022, as the fourth railway port between China and Russia. With over 31 China-Russia trains already departing from various locations in China to enter Russia, the development of railway transportation provides convenient conditions for the growth of China-Russia trade. This is only part of the China-Russia trade that is included in the statistics of China's General Administration of Customs. Some transit trades in other countries or regions have also been revealed to evade U.S. sanctions, according to a survey by Japanese media. 
Russia still imported U.S.-made chips through some newly established small trading companies in China and Hong Kong. Nikkei Asia reported that Russian customs data obtained by an Indian research firm Export Genius showed that there were 3,292 high-value semiconductor imports into Russia between February 24th and December 31st, 2022, with each transaction worth at least $100,000. Approximately 70% of these were labeled as products from U.S. manufacturers, including Intel, AMD, and Texas Instruments, with a total value of at least $740 million. Of the aforementioned chip transactions made in the United States, about 75%, or 1,774 transactions, were exported from mainland China or Hong Kong to Russia. Involving a total transaction value of approximately 570 million U.S. dollars, many of the exporters are small and medium-sized companies, some of which were established after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. According to customs data, during the same period in 2021, there were only 230 high-value U.S. chip transactions exported from Hong Kong and mainland China to Russia, with a total transaction value of only 51 million U.S. dollars. This number has increased by about 10 times since the Russia-Ukraine war. As for Hong Kong, which is the location of these small and medium-sized import-export companies, the year-on-year -year growth rate of mainland China's exports to Hong Kong in March was as high as 20 percent. However, it is unknown how many of these exports are transit trades to Russia. Along with a significant increase in exports to Russia. Exports to countries in the European Union and along the Belt and Road Initiative have also seen growth. The China Railway Express has been continuously expanding its operation scale, leading to an increase in the proportion of railway transportation in China-Europe trade year by year. Compared to sea transportation, the delivery time of the CR Express is only one fourth, and the price is approximately one fifth of air transportation. Making it a convenient option for the transportation of bulk e-commerce products, light industry goods, and high-tech electronic products with strict delivery time requirements. Thanks to the CR Express, it is no longer necessary to transport large quantities of goods from inland to coastal ports for export. Instead, these goods can be transported directly from inland cities. This explains why container prices have dropped. Ports are filled with empty containers. Truck drivers are parking in large numbers at the ports with nothing to do, and yet the export trade volume in March was still very high. The statistics in Chinese port shipping can also serve as evidence. In March 2023, the Shanghai Shipping Exchange released the average value of the Comprehensive Freight Rate Index for Chinese export containers, which was 1,001.27 points, a decrease of 9.3 percent from the previous month. The Shanghai Export Container Comprehensive Index, which reflects the spot market, was 915.9 points, a decrease of 6.6 percent from the previous month. The average freight rate index for Chinese exports to the U.S. West and East Coast routes were 733.91 points and 1,062.14 points, respectively, a decrease of 8.7 percent and 9.2 percent from the previous month. The average freight rate index for Chinese exports to Europe and the Mediterranean routes were 1,273.83 points and 1,773.73 points, a decrease of 10.9% and 8.7%, respectively.